It's a very difficult topic for me, why people get angry. <laughs> this is a long time since I got angry. <laughs> Even recently, I think maybe the Chief Reverend here may be listening, I hope, but last June, I went to visit Sri Lanka and because I'm well respected in Sri Lanka, I had no choice. They took me to the VIP lounge and the VIP lounge in Colombo is very comfortable so you don't need to check in. They just ask for your ticket and they give you a cup of tea. You sit down. And then they go off somewhere and they check you in. So it's very nice and comfortable. But when it came close to the time of my journey, I travel a lot. I know you have to get to the gate at a certain time. And so I asked the, the hostesses in the, the VIP lounge in Colombo Airport, I think I should go to the gate now. And they said, no, sit down. Don't worry, Ajahn Brahm. And that kind of shocked me because that's the first time someone told me not to worry. <laughs> <laughs> I usually tell them. So I sat down and then it got really close to the time of departure. And I said, look, I really think I should get to the gate. We told you, don't worry, we'll look after you. We'll make sure you get to the plane on time. So I sat down again. But then I said, look, the plane's going to leave in five minutes. I've got to get to the gate. I said, okay. So they put me on one of these um, buses or like taxis you know, just to go from the VIP lounge to the gate. When I got to the gate... When I went in there, I had all my documents, boarding passes, everything, and then you could see through the window. <laughs> you know what's happening, not quite. The air bridge was separating you know, from the plane. I miss my flight. <laughs> oh, not my fault at all. But. These things happen, sometimes it's confusion. It's not the end of the world, missing your flight. You just have an extra time in the beautiful um, lounge of Colombo Airport. So that's one thing. I never got angry at that time. And when people started, they heard about it, they were writing to the newspaper in Colombo saying this is really, you should look after monks, especially in a Buddhist country like Sri Lanka. Why didn't you look after Ajahn Brahm? And I said, oh, please, mistakes happen to everybody. And so let it go. Don't get angry. I'm not getting angry. So please, no one get angry back. Just had a wonderful time. Missing a flight. How many of you have ever missed a flight? You know what happens when you miss a flight? When you miss a flight, they usually, they upgrade you on the next flight. <laughs> so it's quite good, it's quite, <laughs> quite nice. And I've used that for many similes. For example, that sometimes, this is you know, not really in sync with the title of the talk, but when um, you know, people get angry, sometimes it's not really angry at anybody, because you can't really blame it. Sometimes there are some uh, mothers who lose their children. And I remember this one lady, years and years and years ago, you know, it's her first child. She became pregnant and she was a healthy lady and a you know, good husband and they did everything right for the pregnancy, but just a couple of days before birth the baby turned in the womb and choked off the blood supply and the umbilical cord. So the baby was still born. It was dead. You can imagine what that's like. You know, your first child doesn't survive. But they're very wise, the parents. You know, one thing which they did, they took 
a biro pen, they drew a line on the baby's heel. You know why they do that? Because they want to see if the baby comes back again. If the baby comes back, it will have that birthmark on its heel. And that's what actually happened. The baby was male, they called it Charlie, still had a, a photograph, I was in the photograph too, and then uh, they did all the ceremonies for the funeral and grieving and stuff, but a few months later she became pregnant again, and this time the doctors really looked after her, made a special effort to make sure that she had ultrasounds and tests and make sure that this time they didn't want to see her losing the baby again. And she didn't. This time the baby was born healthy with a birthmark on its, in its foot, exactly where they put it on their previous baby. And the reason I tell this story because it's like when you, you get bumped off a flight, there's no seats for you. What happens? You get the next available flight and you also get an upgrade. So the new Charlie was born as a female. <laughs> Is that an upgrade? Yes, all <laughs> well, the lady said yes. And she's the... The interesting thing is that because this is a family who come to the temple regularly, you know, you saw little, um, uh, her name was Annie, the new girl, with the, the birthmark. She was a tomboy. She never liked associating with the girls. You know why? She was a boy before. And so for the first few years, she was just a tomboy, just hitting all the girls, but then eventually she feminized after about six or seven years, which is quite usual. It's nice seeing those stories. This is reality. You see it happen. So look, if any of you do know somebody who has this terrible experience, they lose a child, don't give up. If you really want that child, do a little line on the, on the heel or somewhere where they don't usually have birthmarks and wait and see. It's amazing that this actually works. But anyway, that's got nothing to do with anger. But at least I know something about that, about dealing with grief. But with anger, why on earth do people get angry? It doesn't make any sense to me. Does it make any sense to you? One of the reasons is because we've lost our resilience. We're so tight because we're stressed out. Just one more thing, just one more thing, and then people get really upset and angry. It's one of the reasons why, look at my robes. You see why I wear them so loosely? Because they last much longer. If these were really tight, number one, they'd be very difficult to wear, uncomfortable, but also, they would wear out very, very quickly. Sometimes when you see like people having formal wear, when you go to some, like a marriage, a marriage ceremony, how tight are the clothes you have to wear? Especially for the ladies. That should be telling you something. It's like wearing a prison uh, uniform. It's so tight. <laughs> It's all so tight, even, even for the guys. You're in tight clothing. So it's much easier when we can use loose clothing, like monks. Our clothing is very, very practical, the brown robes. Many times people ask me, aren't you ever afraid? Because when you're flying around all over the world, you know, sometimes, sometimes flights get lost, or they get shot down, or there's some tragedies. And if the plane 
blows up at 30,000 feet, what can you do? For me, I've got it all worked out. This rope, if the plane blows up and I have to jump out at 30,000 feet, this is an excellent parachute. <laughs> it's so big, I can just hold each corner and you float down. I haven't tried it yet, but anyway, <laughs> that gives me a positive point of view. But anyhow, you know why it's brown? Did anyone ever explain to you why monks wear brown robes? It's because we can spill tea or coffee on it and we don't have to wash it. You're wearing white, one little bit of coffee or dirt, and it really shows up. It's very practical, being a monk. And that, okay, so let's be anger, yes. <laughs> it's because people are tight that it's very easy if you're pulling this piece of cloth for too long, it will tear. And that's like anger. Basically, people in the West say, you've lost it. You don't gain anything from anger. Number two, this... I was telling a few people in our temple a few days ago, <coughs> please never get angry at monks, because <coughs> you don't know who their disciples are. And at our monastery, there were these two Australian girls, maybe in their mid-twenties, they're young, attractive. I never told people they were both world champion kickboxers. Be very careful, you don't know <laughs> who's who. So they were my bodyguards. Anyway, uh, if you get stressed out, that's when anger can happen very, very easily. At work, at home, in your life, in traffic. <clears throat> Do you have, I know that this is the first time back here after three or four years in Penang, the traffic was looked pretty bad to me. Lots of traffic jams and lots of cars. Do you have road rage in Penang? You do. Please remember this story. This happened in New York, a road rage incident. I don't know what caused it, but anyway, that one car was racing after another car for some reason. They were really upset. They were chasing it this way, chasing it that way, and they finally caught the car they were chasing at the road traffic lights, which turned red. And so this angry driver slammed on his brakes, parked right next to this enemy uh, car driver, jumped out of his car and started banging on the windows. Fortunately for the driver inside the, the car, which was still locked, the traffic lights changed in time, went to green, so he could drive off. And then the driver of the car who was banging on the window, jumped out of his own car, turned around. You should never leave a car with the, with the door open and the engine running in New York. Because he turned around and found there was a street kid inside his car and he drove the car away, stole his car. I know that stealing is against the precepts, but I thought there's some sort of karmic lesson there for the guy who was so angry and jumped out of his car. Please, never get angry. Can you hear all right in the back? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> these two or three people can hear. Right in the very, very back, can you hear? Yeah. Excellent. Are you getting angry? No. Okay, then I can finish the talk. <laughs> no. So you find that in your office, your place of work, or driving a car, or at home, that sometimes anger comes 
because you are too stressed and too tight. And little things happen, the robe tears, or like playing guitar. No, I used to play a guitar when I was a young man. Not anymore. I was hopeless. But I tried. But anyway, in a guitar, if the string is very taut, it's really under big tension, and someone hits it, bing, it sounds very high tone and very loud. If you loosen the tension on the guitar, string and you hit it boom you can still hear it but it's a low pitch and not very loud and imagine there's no tension on that guitar string at all and something hits it very hard with the hammer there's no sound at all that's called resilience it only makes a noise because it's already tense. If you are relaxed, if you are at peace, then people can do all sorts of things and you don't get upset, you don't get angry. I recall so many times, even in Thailand, when I was a young monk, I remember sometimes people tried to make me angry and they were saying all sorts of rude things of me I never got angry at all. I hadn't learned Thai yet. I didn't know what they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> but later on, when people say bad things at you and try to make you angry, it's much better if you refuse to get angry. There was this one, this was almost 50 years ago now. I've been a monk a long time. So this was during the end of the Vietnam War. I had a big American army base over in Ubon. That's where Ajahn Chah's monastery was. And one day there was one of the African-American soldiers. He was in a cycle rickshaw going from the base into the town of Ubon for some business or whatever. And as he was in the cycle rickshaw, the cycle rickshaw passed uh, this little rest place for many of his friends. And they were drinking, drinking Mekong whiskey. And because they were drinking, they lost all sense of what they should be doing or saying. And they looked at this big uh, African-American soldier in the rickshaw and they shouted at him and they abused him and they said, where are you taking that dirty American to? And the American just looked around, just admiring the scenery. Obviously the American could not understand the Thai language. So the driver said, look how dirty he is. I'm taking him into the river in town and throwing him in for a good wash. That was racist, offensive, bad speech. Did the African-American soldier get angry? No. He just looked to the scenery, smiling. And when they got to the destination in town, the soldier got out of the rickshaw and started walking away. And the driver said, so you haven't paid me fair dollars. At which <laughs> the African-American soldier turned around and said in perfect Thai language, dogs don't have money. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone calls you a dog, great, you get a free fare, a free lunch. <laughs> because <laughs> dogs don't have money. <laughs> so that was an example of how to deal with other people's anger or their abuse. Don't get angry back. Instead, you can always turn it to your advantage. As Ajahn Chah would tell me, and it's uh, something which I've never forgotten, 
if anybody calls you a dog, even in, I think, in Penang, in Chinese, it's a very bad thing to call someone. Is that true? What do you do if someone calls you a dog? Sorry? Look at your bottom. Yes. Bark, bark. No, no. You don't need to bark, then you become a dog. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Instead, don't bark. If someone calls you a dog, look at your bottom. See if you have a tail. <laughs> if you don't have a tail, you can't be a dog, can you? So if you see there's a tail there, tell that gentleman, yes, you're right. But if you don't see a tail, say you're wrong, walk away. You don't need to get upset when people abuse you. you know, a lot of times, being a monk, especially the first years over in Australia, a lot of times that people would look at you and try and upset you. I remember just once you know, wearing these robes and loading up a car, we were building our monastery, and then one of these girls from you know, the house close by came up to me and she put her hands on her hips and looked at me with utter disgust. She said, Ugh, you're dressed like a girl. That's sick. That's what she said to me. Because in those days, I mean, how many other men wear robes or skirts or whatever? And so because that's what she said to me, I, my response was exactly what you did. I laughed my head off. I thought that was so funny, and I realized I had another story to tell the next time I gave a talk. Thank you. So instead of getting angry, we turn all these things to our advantage. Like in my life as a monk, you no know, once I got this invitation to a state dinner in Parliament House over in Canberra with Her Majesty the Queen. It's a state dinner with royalty. And I thought, ma, that's a really impressive invitation. So when I actually looked at the invite, you know what they had there, which was difficult? Dress code. <laughs> and that's very strict. I mean, this is not just an ordinary dinner. This is, you know, with, with the Queen of England. So, I looked at that invitation. There were three choices for dress code. The first choice was black tie. Now, I've never been to these posh events before, like a state dinner. So I looked at that black tie. What does that mean? Is that all you have to wear in the presence of a queen? Just a tie and nothing else, no shirt, no trousers. And someone explained to me, no, it does mean a black tie and the rest of the suits and you know, proper shoes. We didn't have that in our monastery, so I couldn't go wearing a black tie. The second choice was military uniform. I couldn't go in that either. When I saw the third choice, I said, yes. I can go. Long dress. <laughs> well, anyway, I went wearing, <laughs> wearing my robe. Security stopped me. Are you meant to be here? And I said, yeah, here's the invitation. It's the number three, long dress, okay? <laughs> and I got away with it. Especially if you've got a sense of humor and you laugh rather than getting angry. It's amazing just you know how people just don't get upset at you and you can go and do these 
things maybe you're not really supposed to do, but you get away with it. You still wear your robes and just have these amazing... Of course, I never had anything to eat at the state dinner because I can't eat in the evening. Did I get angry? No. I have enough at lunchtime. Look how big I am. <laughs> it's an opportunity to go on a diet. And I love going on diets these days. Even recently when I went to UK, when I came back, I'm getting old now, I get jet lag. And honestly, I told the monks, I'm only going to go and take a rest for maybe an hour, and I'll be back down for lunch. I slept right through lunch. And that's the only meal I have. No lunch means no food. And I said to the monks, why didn't you wake me up? He said, well, you know, you just you need a diet. <laughs> <laughs> you can always see the positive side in things rather than getting upset and angry. So when you are relaxed and you laugh a lot, it does mean that you can... Uh, resilience is very, very strong and hardly anybody can make you upset or angry. Try. You can't do it. It's also when you have less which you need in life, less that you want, then it's easy not to get angry. A lot of times anger is frustration we're not getting what we want. For example, I'll tell you a personal story. When I was young, when I was young, like every other young man, I had girlfriends, only one at a time. Couldn't afford two at a time. I don't know how anyone can do that. The Buddha's precepts of, you know, the, the third precepts of Karmesa Michachara, you know, no sexual misconduct, please don't have mistresses, that's very expensive. <laughs> and the only thing you won't get caught, what was it? It was the, the head of the CIA, that's right, it was General Petraeus, a very smart American, head of the CIA. And he had a mistress, he couldn't keep it secret from his wife, not even with all the resources of the CIA, you can't keep it a secret. If he gets busted, you will. <laughs> so, but anyway, the, when uh, my girlfriend said she was going out with somebody else, was I angry? No, I, if ever I meet her again, I say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you hadn't have dumped me, I wouldn't have been able to become a monk. <laughs> Thank you. Even also recently, it's a true story. It's recently, you'd think that you know, a monastery out you know, away from the city, surely everybody would respect that. But a year or two ago, we found that burglars had been into our workshop and they'd stolen many expensive tools, like chainsaws, which we needed to uh, keep the monastery uh, out of danger of bushfires, drills which we used for, for building, and generators that create electricity to power all these tools. So many very expensive tools were stolen. And my first piece of advice to the monks, especially the monks, who were working, and I don't know that if anybody, I'm just talking with Chow Po in the car, just coming up here, about one of the monks staying with me from Penang. You know his name? He always calls himself CC, Chu Chow, what is it? Ching Chong. Do you know him? Yeah. But he's our workmaster now. So he looks after, runs all the work at Bodhinyana Monastery. At least when I'm there, he does all the work. I'm not quite sure what he's doing now when I'm in Penang. <laughs> no, I trust him very much. His name is Jayako now. But anyhow, uh, 
when we were robbed, the first thing I told all the monks, please, they can steal, you know, our building tools, but never let them steal our happiness and our peace and our forgiveness, our Buddhism. They can steal other things, but don't let them steal the Dhamma from your hearts. And of course, the monks were very good, so they never got angry. And anyway, it was all insured. So once, because all these things were insured, we made the claim from the insurance company, and it was given, and with the benefits of the insurance payment to us, we managed to get more tools and better tools, upgrade everything. Financially, it was so positive for us, but I always ask the police, if ever you find who actually did that burglary, please don't put them in jail, just give them, give us their number, because we want to invite them back again. <laughs> give it all the old tools and get some new ones. <laughs> so, you can always see something positive in whatever happens to you in life, instead of getting angry. And I still remember reading this article from the United States, it was a lady, 96 years of age. She'd been healthy all her life. Anyone 96 here? <laughs> 96 years of age, and she went for a checkup. They found she had a cancer. You know what she said? Why me? <laughs> 96, you've got away with it for 96 years, and now you say, why me? Why not? <laughs> okay, that may be funny for you to hear, but if it's really you and personal and you haven't trained yourself to be more accepting, more at peace with things, then that is where a lot of negativity and anger come from. I always ask people to be positive, except for one thing. Please don't be positive with COVID tests. <laughs> You're allowed to be negative there. The same with people always say, Buddhist, you should let go, not be attached. Please be attached. If you're driving on the back of a motorbike through Penang, <laughs> attach, don't let go. <laughs> so, but anyway, why do we get angry? Because we want, and because of those wantings, we plan. We plan too much. And I, I'm saying that, and Chao Po, I've known you for such a long time, been planning this retreat, but please understand, it will go wrong somewhere. It always does. When you understand it's going to go wrong at the beginning, something's not going to turn out as planned. When you understand that from the beginning, you don't get angry. You expected that. When you expect it, you don't get angry, then it means your plans are much more elastic rather than concrete. You must always learn how to adapt to whatever happens in life. Can you adapt? Even in business. I've known lots of very wealthy business people. One of the things they tell me is that sometimes in business, if you have this hard idea of what you want to do and how you want to do it, and you don't know how to, what they say in the US, turn on a dime, go in a totally different direction. You miss opportunities as they come. So it's wonderful to be able to be more adaptable, not so fixed, to have plans, but don't have plans, just plans. Have plan A, plan B, plan C, plan C2, plan D. And once you've finished off the English alphabet, then you can have all the Chinese figures as well, which is immense. <laughs> In other words, have alternatives. 
You don't know which one is going to be the best. And when you can adapt, life becomes much more fun and easy and productive. I never imagined myself, I'm being honest, never imagined myself coming to Penang every couple of years. I was a monk. Why am I keep coming to Malaysia? I've got plenty of people to teach back in Perth. Why do I come here? For fun. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy it. And sometimes people invite me. And if you invite me and I've got the time, then you, you come. And some of the invitations I go to, especially if it's a weird invitation. I love weird invitations. I'm a monk. And sometimes you just go and give a talk about the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, I've been there, done that quite a few times. But you do it sort of in different ways. Once I got this invitation from the World Computer Society. Oh, yeah. In South Korea, in Daejeon, to give the keynote speech at the conference, I think the 2018 World Conference on Computing. <laughs> I know very, very little about computing. <laughs> I don't care. They were inviting me. Why not? That is a, what they say in London. It was a very good earner for our Buddhist society. They gave me um, business class tickets on the aircraft, a nice hotel to stay in, and they gave, how much was it? I think $2,000, I think $10,000 to our Buddhist Society of West Australia as a donation for talking about something I know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> but they asked me that. They said, what are you doing here? You know, what company do you work for? <laughs> How many PhDs have you got in computing? <laughs> Zero. Why are you here? And I think that many of you are smart enough to know the answer. It's because if you ever go to any of these conferences and talks, so often you hear the same old talks, and you can read that up in books, or you get it off the internet. But what you hear here, you can't get off the internet. These different ways of looking at life, different ways of looking at even at computing, Different ways of looking, especially at innovation. That was the main topic of my keynote address. And for innovation, I started off with a simile. I held, I don't have many visual aids, I don't have um, computers at a computer conference to put up slides. I lifted up the same as I'm lifting up now. And I asked the audience, what is this? Now I'm asking you, what is this? Yeah, what else? Yes, come on. 500 ml, what else? Now straight away, you're making these answers, thinking there's a correct answer. Maybe a tricky answer, but there's a correct answer. There is no correct answer. If you think you have a correct answer, you don't have to look at this anymore. You don't have to investigate it. You don't have to look deep and see what else can this be? You know, one thing it is, I noticed years ago, Evian. Was Evian backwards? Naive, yes. You can get better water out of a tap sometimes for free. This is na naive water. I might get sued for that, I don't know. But anyway, 
When you look longer without having any answers, you can see more. That is a, a good example of what insight is. Now, I'm going to be teaching a retreat. This is the first talk of a retreat. But it's more like a public talk. How can you see what other people haven't seen? To innovate in your business, whatever you're doing in this in Penang, how can you actually get some progress? You look at whatever you're doing and see deeper than anyone else has. Keep looking at it, keep looking, 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 looking. It's amazing, different things you can see in something just like a bottle of water. It's much, much more than that. They really appreciated that, because it was a different angle. And the other thing which I told them, which actually I just, I've mentioned to you many, 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 many times before. But here it comes again. You don't have many visual aids. I just use whatever's in front of me. And this is, what is stress? A lot of time people get angry because they get stressed out. You get stressed out at work and you've got wonderful attitudes and you're trying to make some, enough money to send your kids to a good school, you know, to buy a nice house or a good car, you know, to support your family and sometimes you know, to support your parents or grandparents and also you know, to support your monk. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got many calls. Do you have enough money? Silence. I expected, <laughs> expected that. Of course, it's never enough. But why do we get stressed out? This is a talk about the meaning of stress and a very, very simple solution. I first did this simile at Imperial College in London. That's a very top college in London University. And I said, how heavy is this bottle of water? And some smart addict said, 300 grams. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I mean. The longer you hold it, the heavier it feels. I've been holding this for about 20 seconds, foot extension. It's now getting heavier and heavier and heavier. What should I do before this starts to hurt my arm? Put it down. Yes. So what do you do when you're stressed out at work and you, know, you can't find any solutions? <laughs> Resign. <laughs> no, la. Don't resign yet. Relax. You know that, I don't know what it is like in Malaysia, but I know in US, they have in every big organization, small organization, small shops, they have what we call restrooms. <laughs> every place has that. And you can always ask to go to the restroom. And no one will ever stop you. You ask to go to a meditation room, and they say, no, 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 too busy. <laughs> they never say that when you want to go to a restroom. So you go to the restroom. And when you get in the restroom, you can stay there as long as you like. You can lock the door. And if your boss says, you know, you've been in the restroom for 15 minutes, why? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, constipation. <laughs> but tell me, your brain is constipated, not your whatever else it's called. <laughs> but anyhow, that means you can take a break, take a rest in the restroom. That's what you're supposed to do in the restroom. So if you take a rest in the restroom, it means that afterwards, your brain is re-energized. It's working back at full power. Just like when you charge up your mobile phones. 
it's back to full power. Now try that. Because if you do try that, you'll find you become far more productive. Your work is of a higher quality. And you produce more work in less time. I don't just say these things, I actually practice them. You know that, that first book which I wrote, The Opening the Door of Your Heart book, how many of you have read that? That's all. <laughs> Crikey. You know, even one person who's read that book, I'm just going off, uh, was somebody showed me a photograph which was taken of this film actress, Sarah Jessica Parker, in a coffee shop in New York, reading, opening the door of your heart. So I thought, wow, this is exciting. I thought, if she really likes it, then I'll be invited to do a cameo appearance <laughs> on her TV show. Until I found out her TV show. <laughs> what was his name? Yeah, I can't go on that show. <laughs> but one thing I did notice is somebody uh, knows that story, that now that uh, you know, she, like, unlike so many other film actresses, she doesn't try to dye her hair, to have implants, to use Botox. She actually does look her age. And there's very, very few film stars or TV stars, you know, who are beautiful when they were young, you know, just let the body age. It's far more comfortable for her. Why does she always need, sorry? Why does she always need, you know, just to look like a film star? It's terrible if you're well known. I know how that feels. <laughs> I, I was in UK recently, giving talks and giving uh, retreats. We gave a retreat in the town of Sheffield, that's Yorkshire, uh, not a big city, but you know, it's quite an important city. When I, you know, from the station, the railway station, walk into the venue, it's nice to have some exercise, it's only maybe half an hour's walk, when I was walking to the venue, the local council were doing roadworks. And as I was walking past one of these huge backhoe, you know, the earth moving, the guy driving the backhoe looked at me, stopped his engine, opened the window and said, hey, you are the spitting image of Ajahn Brahm in Australia. <laughs> He never expected to see Ajahn Brahm in Sheffield <laughs> while he was working. I was supposed to be in Australia, okay, Penang sometimes, <laughs> but not Sheffield. And I said, yes, that's because I am Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> <laughs> and he stopped his machine. And so the council lost quite a bit of money, I reckon. He stopped his machine, stopped all the work for photo session. <laughs> This is not just Indonesians who do this. Any Indonesians here? Confess. <laughs> I love Indonesians. But this was like a Yorkshire man. And all the crew had to stop as well for about 10 minutes while they took photographs. So I don't want to sort of stop people. It's also other, other times. It's wonderful actually over in even Australia because most of the people in the airport know me now. So I have no trouble going through. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, should I? But anyway, that's a nice thing. But on another occasion, going over from uh, Perth over to Indonesia, uh, to Jogjakarta to give a retreat or something or other. And on the aircraft, just you know, in a nice economy class seat around the back, then this, you know, as happens on aircraft, these flight attendants come up and say, you got your seatbelt fastened and everything. And then she looked at me and stopped. She froze. She said, 
are you Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> and I replied, the last time I looked, yes. <laughs> and then she started gushing, oh, I must be your biggest disciple in Indonesia. I read all your books. Oh, thank you for being on my flight. It's a bit embarrassing, but at least I know I get really good service. <laughs> you know what happened mid-flight? After I got all that wonderful extra service from one of my biggest disciples in Indonesia, she came up to me and said, um, would you mind coming up to the galley? That's the front of the plane. It's only a small plane. So when I went right up to the front, had all the flight attendants all lined up, photo session. That's <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous. And right in the galley where the flight attendants hang out, they had all these lights going on from the passengers. It was actually from Perth, first of all, to Bali, and they would change planes to get to Jogjakarta. And these were all the Australians who were going on a holiday. They wanted another beer. And they said, no, you have to wait until the photo session is finished. <laughs> they were angry at me. I can understand why they did get angry, but it didn't do anything. And when I actually walked back to the back of the plane, all these Australians, they were looking <laughs> at me with a lot of anger because I delayed the ability to get sort of some refreshments on the aircraft. I kind of, you know, like that sort of stuff. It gives entertainment and some nice stories to tell other people. When you are light-hearted, you find you can't get angry. And even tonight, if you've laughed and you enjoyed some of the stories, you will find that things which would normally set your anger off will not. And when your anger is reduced, the tightness and tension in your body is also reduced. Your breathing is much easier. Your health improves. Not just your physical health, but your emotional health as well. You find you have time to spend with those people you love. You're not in such a rush. Everything, this is, this is it. next door to the amateur free medical and diabetic center. Here, <laughs> not over there, here. <laughs> the amount of medical benefits you get from the Dhamma is huge. People, because they change their attitude towards life, you don't tend to get so sick. You tend to heal up. You don't worry so much. You're not so tense. You're not so angry about life. You find so much more peace in your existence. And because of that, you live healthy, healthier and happier. That's my problem. I don't get sick. I can't take a rest. A couple of my monks, well actually one, uh, they called up, said they got COVID. I think that's selfish. Because now you can go on retreat for was it seven days, nine days. They call it quarantine. I call it retreat. <laughs> People take food to him. <laughs> it's not that bad. So anyhow, it's wonderful when you are healthy and happy. And you can share that with others. To have a beautiful life, productive, but without stress. Helping your family and to society and everybody you ever meet. The amount of work which I do, honestly, I should be dead by now. I'm, but I'm very productive. I was saying that first book which I wrote, I've got the original manuscript still in my, I won't say where it is. That original manuscript, that book has been a bestseller many times over. And... I wrote the first half of it in 13 days, two weeks, one hour a day while I was on retreat by hand. 
not sort of typing it, just writing it hand. I've got the original manuscript. There's no mistakes in it, hardly any mistakes. No crossings out. I just was meditating, started writing, and the stories that came out by themselves. But sometimes I look at that, and I'm sort of, the word over in Australia, they call it gobsmacked. Do you know that word? Gobsmacked, bamboozled. It means that you're, you're quite shocked, even the many times you see it. How can you just write all this stuff out and it doesn't need to be edited? You know how that book was published, too? How was, you know that sometimes people find it so hard to find a publisher? Even just think the Harry Potter books. They were rejected many times before. Not mine. <laughs> what happened, if you haven't heard the story, that I, that I had to get someone to type it up on a disc in those days. Not a USB, but a disc. And so when they typed it up, they just gave it to me at the airport. I was just flying off to Melbourne to give a, a retreat and some talks. The first talk was in Melbourne University. And so uh, they just gave it to me. I hadn't even checked it yet, but, you know, that was all just on a disc. When I got to the university, I gave a talk. It was a nice talk. And then after the talk was finished, this lady came up and said, that was a really nice talk. I work in the publishing industry. If ever you want anything published, please let me know. And I reached in my bag. Here you are. <laughs> and that's absolutely accurate. And they published it. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't even send it to anybody. They came and got it from me. That's a beautiful thing, how these things work. But anyway, it's now, I've been talking for an hour. I talk too much, I know. That's one thing I've told you, that when you get old, my 73rd year now, when I get old, maybe your legs are a bit slower, your arms are weaker, your eyes, you need glasses, your ears, you need sort of, uh, to listen very carefully or you need sort of ear something or others but the one thing the one part of your body which gets stronger with every year is your mouth <laughs> <laughs> so that's why i can talk forever but anyhow it's now an opportunity is that correct to do the questions okay so has anybody got any Questions. We usually call it in Perth the three C's. Questions, comments, and complaints. I know questions it begins with a Q, but I prefer saying it's a C. Questions, comments, or complaints. Any questions from our participants? Oh, good. Thank you for coming back today after the uh, John, I just have uh, one question. Uh, lately, I've been uh, seeing a lot of pictures on the internet that depict the Buddha who is head resting on the knee. What are your thoughts of this sort of figurines uh, or images? Always look at the positive side of it. Buddhas must be tired. <laughs> it's resting on its knee. I don't think anybody's doing that to offend anybody. It's just like a, a figure of rest. So if any during this retreat, if you have sloth and torpor, if it's okay for the Buddha to rest his head on his, on his knee, it must be okay for you to do the same. So I don't look at the internet that much, so I, I haven't seen those images. Are they respectful or are they just done to try and offend somebody? Are you going to show me? Okay, here's the hard evidence. Oh, that's fine, yes. It's Buddha taking a bit of a rest. Imagine just all of the, the talks he has to give and all of the responsibility he has. Imagine having to look after the welfare and benefits of all sentient beings. It's bad enough for me just looking after you lot. And for the Buddha, oh, that made my head heavy as well. 
Now that's quite respectful. I've seen that before. There's nothing wrong about that at all. Yes. Atambra, is it possible for anyone not yet thinking anandami to not having any anger at all? Y yes. For the time. In other words, sometimes people have anger, but they can stop it very quickly. In other words, it makes no sense to them. Especially that some of the places you have anger is the people you love. Why is that? Somebody once explained to me, you know, it is because maybe, are you married yet? Are you married? Yes, okay. Sometimes if you're married, you know, your wife might get angry at you. But it's really not because you've done something wrong. She's stressed out, having some difficulties, and you're the person she loves. She wants to be able to communicate with you. And she trusts you. Don't listen to her anger, listen to what's behind it. Which is, you know, the problem she's facing, maybe at work or maybe with her health or with kids or whatever. Listen to that. And you'll find that that's one of the reasons why people who are very close to you sometimes get angry, you, angry at you the most. It's not any fault of yours. It's just they want to let you know, maybe, so you can help. Does that make sense to you? Okay, great. Yes. Oh, I got the, here we go run. It's always a very good exercise for the MC. <laughs> yeah, then, uh, my question would be about perhaps the aftermath of the anger itself. Oh, yeah. And, um, well, let's say, if, uh, unintentionally, I caused anger to perhaps someone that uh, is dear to me, like maybe, you know, parents or relatives. Or oh, such. yes. But um, then again, it is perhaps because of certain uh, words that I said, and it triggers the anger, but it's um, not really intentional. And perhaps it's just in their nature to react very angrily to what, what I do, even though I have no intention to cause anger at all. Yeah. So do you think it is um, skillful, a skillful thing to uh, limit my communication with them, like skillful shelter? And also how, um, because there's like, uh, well, maybe no intention to cause anger, but anger has been caused. So how much of the karma do I actually have to that? A lot of time, if it's no intention, it's no karmic effect. That's how strong intention must be. But nevertheless, if you know, that if you don't choose your words correctly, you may cause that anger. You still have a responsibility to try and learn what those triggers are and to not to use them anymore. Use different ways of speaking. It's amazing when you change your language you can actually get the same results without the anger. It's also when you speak to your parents. Never speak to your parents if they're a bit sensitive about some issues at a time when they're tired or like in public. Even like I say this for those people who are married, that if you have a partner and it's something difficult you have to tell them, take them out for dinner a nice dinner at a fancy restaurant and after the last course you can say anything to them <laughs> they don't get angry you need to be softened up and that's not just a joke, that actually works unfortunately I tell my monks that story so they make sure that when I come back I've had a good rest and maybe a good lunch and after a good lunch with a nice cup of tea afterwards the Ajahn Brahma need to tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> it works. But the aftermath of it, if you have caused any uh, problems, especially for your parents, you, know, you love them to bits. And if there's something which happened, just it's wonderful to ask forgiveness. If you can do a forgiveness ceremony, that overcomes the anger so easily, if it's really genuine. It's one of the reasons why any times I do a marriage ceremony, I ask the husband, the wife, 
to promise me that every year on the anniversary they will do a forgiveness ceremony together. My husband, anything I've done by body, speech or mind, intentional or unintentional, things I didn't do which I should have done. I'm sorry. Do you mean it? And then the other pine has to say the same back. That's incredibly powerful. Just once a year, just the two of you. And that means you're admitting you're not perfect. You have faults and mistakes. And that means that you can learn to be better husbands, better wives, better monks. Thank you, Adam, for that advice. Thank you for forgiveness. But what if um, perhaps the, the action that is done that caused the anger, in, in my opinion, is actually good for the person? Well, you still ask forgiveness. It's in a sense, it's good that I needed to tell you that, but I never want to upset you or hurt you or harm you. Forgiveness is a beautiful ceremony. I still remember this occasion. It was two monks years and years and years ago. One was an ex-US Marine, shot in the back of the head in Vietnam, and lucky to survive. He eventually became a monk. The other one was a Jewish real estate millionaire from Chicago. Very tough guy, made a couple of million many years ago and retired. And then became a monk. And the two of them were having this standoff, these two Americans shouting at each other nose to nose. No one was going to give in. We really thought it was going to be a fight. Monks fighting, it should never happen, but it looks like it was going to. They never did, because the ex-Vietnam veteran, he used, to, he used to belong to street gangs in Buffalo, New York City, New York State, and he stopped. And he went on the floor, and he bowed three times, the Jewish real estate millionaire, who was a monk, you know, what they call Jubud these days. He bowed three times and asked forgiveness. And his adversary, the big businessman, now a monk, just started crying. They wept and hugged, and that was the end of it. A simple act of forgiveness, if it's sincere, it's got great emotional power. Okay, next question. Oh my goodness. Okay, in the back. You've got a long way to run now. Sajjan <laughs> uh, Ram, I want to, I would like to ask, what, how do we deal with uh, the anger towards ourselves? When uh, we are pain, we are sick, we feel that ah, oh, his body, yeah, there's an anger. Yes. How how should we deal with it? Well, first of all, again, when I said that many times of anger arise because we make plans, and the plans get frustrated. Another word for plans is expectations. Lower your expectations of your body, lower your expectations of your business. For those of you who can't find a partner in life, lower your expectations, <laughs> and then you'll find a partner. <laughs> we have unrealistic expectations about our body. and Sometimes we think our body is letting us down. It's not letting you down. It's just we're not understanding it well enough. Number one, there's something which we always say when we go and see the doctor with an ache or a pain or a fever. What do we say? There's something wrong with me, doctor. I've got a fever. There's something wrong. I'm sick. There's nothing wrong with being ill. It's part of nature. 
is the way the body deals with illnesses. If there's some sort of uh, pain, it's usually there's inflammation somewhere. It's, the body is trying to protect some part of the body which is being injured. You know, if there is, uh, say, diarrhea, it's because you've eaten something which the body needs to reject as soon as possible. A fever is because there's some sort of bacteria or virus which the body wants to burn off. A lot of what we say is sicknesses, it's just the body's way of overcoming danger. Yes, sometimes the body overreacts, but at least it's reacting. It shows you there's something deep inside there. So a lot of times, if you can, if you're very, very sick, just rest a lot and don't worry. You know what Ajahn Chah taught me? I had this, uh, no one knew what it was at the time, it was scrub typhus, same, same um, symptoms as typhoid. And Ajahn Chah came to see me, I was a young monk, when it's your teacher, very busy, big monk comes to see you in hospital, Oh, it was so wonderful. I felt so that he actually knew me and he was looking after me. Everything was, I was so uplifted until he opened his mouth. And he said, Brahma Wangsa, you'll either get better or you'll die. <laughs> and then he left. You can't argue with that. You don't get angry. You understand the nature of your body. And the other thing I will say, because I've seen this too many times in the 70 years I've been, uh, 72 years I've uh, been on this planet Earth, no one ever knows what the outcome is going to be. It seems some amazing results. I went to, an auto, uh, to a, a hospice a month ago and I told him the story of one of these people who went to a hospice you know, the first day he was there. You only go to a hospice to die, to get palliative care, not expected to survive. So he went to this hospice with lung cancer. He'd been smoking cigarettes. And the first thing he did when he got into the hospice, the nurse asked him, what do you want for dinner tonight? because they really try to look after you in the hospice. And then he started to say, well, I can't have anything oily because I've got high cholesterol. I can't have anything sweet because I've got diabetes. I can't have any anything salty. I've got hardened arteries. And then the nurse shut him up and said, listen, you're not going to die of a heart attack you're going to die of cancer in about five days. You can eat whatever you want. <laughs> the cancer's going to kill you. But then when he was told he could eat whatever he wants, it was the first time in years that he could eat his favorite food. Even over in, <laughs> you'll enjoy this little story, over in the conference in Singapore where I came from last weekend. There was one of the doctors there was saying that one of these, his patients, you know, he had, um, you know, he was dying. And so that, uh, you know, what medicine can he take? And he needed fiber. He didn't have diabetes, so he could eat sugary things. So the doctor said, I prescribe for you half a durian every day. Now, just like you, the guy just got, really, I can eat durian? My wife has never let me eat durian for weeks. I'm not letting you, it's prescribed. You have to, doctor's orders. <laughs> and he enjoyed that diagnosis so much that he started getting better. Now, I'm not going to tell you the doctor's name, Otherwise, you'll probably go and contact him. <laughs> Even if you're not sick, you'll contact him. But that was interesting that 
even this guy who was, said he could eat whatever he wanted, even though he's only supposed to last about five or six days, his cancer went into remission. And he actually walked out of that hospital, go home. He had, in the hospice, he had to go back six months later to die properly. But for that six months, he had extra six months because of the joy and the happiness which he had. Never underestimate the power of that happiness and joy when you're really, really sick. The negativity, the anger, the depression, that will hasten the death of the body. The joy, the happiness, that will actually can even cure you. I've seen that too many times. I hope that makes sense to you. I don't know what the sickness is, but because you've got a bald head, I don't think you've been a monk, so probably cancer somewhere. Anyway, I have another question before we finish off. Yes? Remember, I only come every three or four years, so we have to wait another three years. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm, hello. Yes. Everyone. Um, I have this question, but it's not related to tonight's topic on anger. Please um, go ahead. My query is that in Buddhism, is there the uh, belief of the existence of souls, as in S O U L S? Do it? Yeah. Like for me, I believe that. I am the body, the mind, and the soul. Yeah. So my question is, in Buddhism, is, is there the belief of souls? Yeah. yeah. What there is the belief in is, we call it stream of consciousness. That stream of consciousness, it's good that you're getting closer and closer. Not a brain, the brain is a body. Again, at this conference, which I was uh, just presenting at in Singapore, I managed to convince this Buddhist fellowship to also invite one of my old friends, the first Buddhist I ever met, Professor Bernard Carr. He was a close, I mean really close, uh, assistant to Professor Stephen Hawkins. He was a theoretical physicist. And we're talking about the nature of you know, modern science is way too materialistic. They just do not admit to the existence of a mind. They even think that the mind is just some uh, byproduct of a brain. And that is, um, it is logically, scientifically not tenable. You can't argue that. You know, the, the mind exists. If there's any scientists here, you know, this was one of my friends because we did the same things over in Cambridge. Theoretical physics, astrophysics. And also, interestingly, we also, Bernard and I, were members of the Psychic Research Society. Anything weird we go and investigate, not afraid of, we get as much equipment as we possibly could. He was also telling us, reminding me, that one of the experiments which I assisted him on was we thought like astral projection, like out-of-body experiences. And he thought, and if a soul is, has any weight to it, any mass to it, then when a person even goes to sleep or just you know, has an astral projection, their body should get lighter. And then he was joking. He said, he tried that on me. He said, no, my body never got lighter at all. <laughs> he said, because as obvious, Ajahn Brahm has such a very lightweight soul. <laughs> that was his joke. But no, the stream of consciousness, and that stream of consciousness uh, can continue after you die. That stream of consciousness can be the spirits, which sometimes people see. 
I told another interesting story which people liked because Ajahn Bumali was also there co-presenting with me over in Singapore. And I told the story of one of my other monks in Perth, Venal Nibuto. He was from the Punjab. And he told me the story in his village. He was there at the time. In his village, first of all, I should say, all the men have got the same surname, Singh. And all the women have the same surname too, Kaur. And so a few of them have got such similar names. And so one morning, an elderly lady with the surname of Kaur passed away. She died. And this was not a long time ago. It's not a remote village. It had proper doctors, and the doctors examined her. She was dead. So they arranged the funeral that evening, the cremation. But before they could cremate the body, Mrs. Kaur woke up. You know, she wasn't dead after all. Surprised everybody. But sometimes you hear about those st stories. They think someone's dead, they put them in the box, and they're not dead. But soon after she passed away, so she, soon when she came back, she told her experience, what happened. She said that once she kind of died, then these two spirits grabbed hold of her and dragged her to this like big boss spirit. And this big boss spirit scolded the two minor spirits. You've got the wrong Mrs. Core. <laughs> take her back. So they had to take her back, and that's when she woke up. She wasn't dead after all. And a few minutes later, another Mrs. Core passed away. <laughs> and I told that story because you know, Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali, <laughs> our names are not that different. <laughs> So if one of us dies, no, be, be careful, wait for a little while. <laughs> but there are like these things, streams of consciousness, once they die, we can look at them similar to the idea of spirits. The idea of a, like a soul, the idea of your kind of fundamental characteristics. You know, who are you? How do you know who you are? If you go from a boy to a girl, from life to life. There's still some things about you which are similar. Those are like karmic imprints you know, on your stream of consciousness, which can sometimes make you recognizable. Now, what are my karmic imprints? How do you know this is really Ajahn Brahm here today? Bad jokes, that's one. <laughs> Want a, a nice joke? Okay, there was, I don't know if this is the same over here in Penang, but over in a sort of places like Australia, kids don't like going to school in the morning. You can't get them out of bed. Is that the case here? Okay, so the mother went to her son's bedroom one morning and said, son, you've got to get up to go to school. And the son said, oh, but I don't want to go to school, mummy. But you have to go to school, son. Why should I go to school, mummy? None of the other kids like me. The teachers don't like me. No one likes me at school. Why should I go to school, mummy? Because, son, you're the headmaster. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. But anyway, there's the karmic imprints. So that's actually how Buddhists regard these things. Not an indestructible soul which stays the same from life to life, but sometimes recognizable. Just like a nice simile, it's like a river. I'm not quite sure the big rivers in Penang, but say like a big river like the Seine or the, or the Thames, say. When I go to, to London, you look at the Thames, and it looks similar to when I grew up. But every year, because of floods and erosion, it slightly changes its course. 
And the water in it is nothing to do with the water I saw under the Thames when I was a kid. It looks the same, but it's totally different. It's changed, evolved, it has similarities. Your characteristics are just like the course of the river. It changes slowly. It can change. And the water is always flowing, a stream of consciousness, said the Buddha. And that's the accurate description. Does that answer the question? Okay, thank you. Okay, it's now half past. Are we supposed to finish now? That's my question. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in the demo, let us all uh, share our appreciation to Ajahn Brahm for giving us this public talk and let us all pay respect together and say sadhu. Sadhu! Sadhu! Sadhu!